Greetings everyone. Here I am today sitting with uh, my Nena and uh, with Lynn and Justin in the uh, Menla Mountain Retreat and Resort Spa and in the spa building, which is the only building that is heated at the moment because everything is on sort of deep freeze. And uh, although spring is coming and our Lisa is working on the organic garden and other people are doing maintenance, a few people, but everyone is uh, holding fast and, and hopes that Menla will survive and Tibet House will survive because we are a small nonprofit and when there's no income and no people coming in and helping and so on, it's very uncertain. So, uh, but anyway, since uh, people are, have been sent to their room, as someone said, which was my favorite, they've been sent to their room by Mother Nature to think about what we human beings have done. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I really like that. Since we're all doing that, we are online is the way we can communicate and we can gather in a virtual community. So I'm very happy to talk to you today from here. Behind me is the painting of the thousand-armed, eleven-headed Avalokiteshvara, who is the, the god of great compassion, you know, the god who cares about the beings, not just some big shot who created them, but someone who cares about them. That's what Avalokiteshvara means. And there's a beautiful painting. The thousand arms are only a symbol, of course, of infinite numbers of arms, of the force of compassion in the universe which even in the days of the coronavirus, the Mahayana Buddhists, and really all the Buddhists, that's what they think actually. And a lot of religious people do in other traditions as well, in, a, in whatever way they sort of formulate it, you know. And secularists too, some humanists, they feel that, that there's sort of there's compassion in the world. So uh, before I go into today's talk, which I thought I would make about the Vimalakirti Sutra, I really like that sutra. When I first translated it, I was commissioned to translate it in 1972, when I had just finished my doctoral degree, and I didn't have a job and I didn't have any money to speak out. And a wealthy and very kind Chinese gentleman who was establishing an institution, he commissioned me to really, and originally he just wanted me to edit somebody else's translation of that sutra. Um, the Wei Mo Jing, we call it in Chinese. Um, uh, just that's all he wanted to do. But I said, no, that's not sensible. We should instead do a new one from the Sanskrit, which we don't have, but the Tibetan is very close to the Sanskrit. So we should do a new one, completely new, and go to that, because the Chinese, that particular Chinese one was done in such a way that you know it was sort of a little more improvised, you know, and it was written to make it nice in classical Taoistic Chinese, and it missed a lot of the sort of interesting elements that are in the Tibetan and in the Sanskrit, the original one. So he agreed to that a little bit hesitantly, and I went ahead and did it. And I was amazed in doing it, because I had already been a monk for a few years, and uh, I thought I was pretty hotshot about it all already. Um, but um, I was never just saw some of the things that are in that sutra. It's only a short sutra. The, my translation was 108 pages long into English, and um, but it is really deep and amazing things it has in it. And then I gave a copy of the English translation to my guru, my old teacher, the old Mongolian uh, uh, teacher, Geshe Wangyal, uh, in New Jersey, who was elderly at that time. And uh, he, and I said, well, Gishala, I know you don't read these books in English because you read them in Tibetan, but this you can put in the library of the monastery. It's the Vimalakirti Sutra, and so I'd like to offer it to the monastery copy. And he looked at this, glanced at it, and he said, oh, he said, you're just beginning to study that. I said, no, no, I translated it, actually. I said, you know, I said Yes, he said, you're just beginning to study it. And then again, I repeated, no, 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 I've been studying it a lot. I tried to say, I said, yes, you're just beginning to study it. He repeated for the third time. So then I gave up. And um, over the years, that's what, 1972, that's 48 years ago, um, I had to realize he was right. There's so much in there that I thought I knew what it was. Then I remember about uh, a few years later, 
a colleague of mine from England, American guy, but lives in London. He was uh, gave a talk at a seminar that I organized, and his topic was, do you have to understand a text in order to translate it? <laughs> and the bottom line was, no, you just translate the words accurately, and you can still be ignorant about it in the new language as you were in the old language. So I thought he was, I took it a little personally, I must say, but, uh, but now I don't, but now I realize how clever that was. So then I've done it again, and you all can get that sutra for free from the 84,000.com website, Word of the Buddha 84,000.com. One really nice lama, the Kenze Rinpoche, Zongzar Kenze Rinpoche, who lives in Bhutan and around the world, he, trans, he uh, raises money and he hires people and then they pay per page to translators around the world to translate the Buddhist literature into English. And I think that's a really great. I was at their inaugural thing and I wanted to help, but they haven't let me help much. But that's okay because I'm doing a lot of other translations anyway. But um, uh, and then I retired and I have even more time to bug around about all of this. So uh, anyway, on that I gave them, I have the rights to my own translation, and I gave them my um, Bhimala Kirti translation because it was very popular in English, in college courses and by people in general, it, because it's a nice short sutra and has elements of all of the massive, huge, enormous Mahayana, great vehicle Buddhist sutras, sort of the universalist Buddhism, that means great vehicle Buddhism. Where Buddhism, where everybody is going to become a Buddha, you know, all of you are going to become Buddhas. I'm even going to become a Buddha. My all my friends, we'll all be we'll all be Buddhas, but we're, that doesn't mean we're already Buddhas. Uh, although when we get to be a Buddha, we'll think maybe we were already Buddhas, but but now we certainly don't feel like that, and we're working toward it. And as long as you don't feel like that, you're not it. So then you should work toward it actually by being kind and being intelligent and and uh, persisting, you know, many lives it will take sometimes, many, many lives. And if you don't know you're going to have many lives, get over it, because you are, because everything keeps going forever, you know. And even Buddha has many lives. Many people wrongly think Buddha has no more lives. That's completely wrong. Buddha has infinite lives simultaneously, even, because he exists everywhere, he, she, or it exists everywhere in time, as well as space. And uh, he also, he, she, or it, also has to manifest by his own vow, by his own determination. He has to manifest wherever anybody else is suffering. Any other, and that's not just human, you know, ants or cockroaches or rats or ticks. Now a question came up on my website, someone sent in a, a question from one of my other talks saying, does a virus have sentiency? Is it a sentient being according to Buddhism? And that, that's similar to other people ask, do, do plants, are they sentient beings? And there are many people who are convinced that they are. And in a way, I, you know, it's, a, it's an open question. Uh, in the case of Buddhism, uh, Buddha sort of said, well, it's not necessarily convenient to consider them as sentient beings in the sense of having to worry about them, like we do about actual sensitive sentient beings. But that doesn't mean that he was dogmatic about it, because one thing that the Buddha said was, whatever you say about relative reality, which is kind of magical and illusory, is not the final thing to say. There is no final description of reality. Reality is inconceivable. If, if, uh, if inanimate things were um, suffering, then Buddha, Buddha could be an inanimate thing. You know, Buddha, Buddha vows that when I'm a Buddha, I, I, if people need a new planet, I'll be a new planet. If they vow that if they need a tree, I'll be a tree. If they need a bridge, I'll be a bridge. If they need an island, I'll be an island. If they need medicine, I'll be medicine. So that means that a Buddha, who was certainly once a sensitive being, and as a Buddha perhaps remains somewhat sensitive, at least they say a Buddha feels bliss, and you know, without stopping, so that's sensitivity. So then if a Buddha can be an inanimate object, then how can you say that a virus is not animate? You know, whereas Western science, I think technicality, technically they say virus doesn't self-reproduce like a bacteria does. 
in some way, it has to go get symbiotic with something to reproduce itself. And that means it's not a sentient being, according to, it's not an animal, you know, as a bacteria is an animal. I think biology makes that kind of distinction. But, but uh, that's just their own distinction. And again, although they like to think whenever, and human beings are such that whenever they make a rule about something, or they come up with something that seems to describe something that they see in front of them, they make a big fuss about that's what it is. And then they get all they fight for it and they go through a whole thing about it. But Buddha's thing initially, from the minute that he understood reality, he said there is no final description of relative reality. In a way, the only final description is the final description of ultimate reality. And that is the final description of that is that there is no final description. <laughs> so, which means that, you know, like is a virus an animate being or not, or whatever, or is Bob Thurman an animate being? There's no final word on that subject. There are words that seem to fit with the current behavior, and uh, and they, they're awaiting disproof by further false, you know, by being falsified by further behavior or by further discoveries, you know, just like Karl Popper's theory of uh, nature of scientific uh, scientific descriptions of the world. So Buddha was the original scientist in that sense, a hundred percent. And also, I had a student one time, a John, who sort of proudly told me one point just to sort of feel independent, I guess, of his father figure, former teacher, is he said, oh, Bob, so sorry to tell you, there is no such thing as Buddhist science. <laughs> and I said, this was after, obviously, he graduated a long time back. So then, he, then I said, well, what do you mean? Uh, why do you say that? And he says, well, no theory revision, he says. Then he ran away, so we couldn't debate it, or of course I would have refuted that. But, um, and he hasn't showed up ever since. <laughs> He's still stuck on that final word that he gave there and then departed. You're never supposed to make a final word unless you're ready to listen to the next one, actually, in that light, very Buddhist also. So, uh, of course, there's nothing but theory revision is the point. That's where he's wrong. See, he said that because he thought that Buddha said, I know everything, which Buddha did when he was happy, when he was mourning of his enlightenment, and all thereafter many times he said, although sometimes he said there is no such thing as a Buddha, he would say, said that. And anybody who says, I am a Buddha, they're making a mistake, he said that, sometimes, in some context. But in the, in the, in the main context, and when he was really trying to be serious, he said, I know everything, I'm, and I'm, I'm sure of how it is, I know how it is. I've experienced how it is, he said, and it's wonderful. That was, it's nirvana, you know, and when you know what it is, you realize it's nirvana. That means freedom from suffering. So it's freedom. That's what reality is, is freedom. That's what he's saying. Nirvana means freedom. So, but then, then this is where the theory, so, so he thought, oh, that's a theory, so he never revised that theory, so there's no theory revision. But wait, you, you, know, you have to wait. That's just the first thing he said. The next thing he said right away was, I'm very sorry, but I can't explain it to you. That's impossible to describe. There's no theory that will capture the amazingness of this reality that you can experience, and because I've experienced it, I know you can experience it, but there's nothing that will describe it. So it doesn't fit under any theory, really, except that, that there is no theory. But that's a different than other kind of theory. It can't be a dogma, it's an openness is what that means. It's just openness to reality. So, therefore, theories are nothing but constant in constant process of self-revision. So my student, John, and in case you ever listen to this, you're wrong. He's absolutely a scientist because all his theories are revisions. And he is, the caveat being, there is no ultimate theory. But the way human beings are, they're going to make ultimate theories out of various things. So, so in a way, you can even say, yeah, they're ultimate theories. But they just don't last. <laughs> so, no shortage of revision. So, so the thing is, that, so that's, isn't that wonderful? I think, personally, that's really marvelous. Because it's a little different from other scientists who get stuck on their theories, the standard model, the current guys are really freaking out, really, actually, like everybody else on the planet right now. 
the current scientists are really freaked out. They think that they act like they're really great and they have tenure and they have huge grants and they have big machines and they, they patent things and make a lot of money and they act very authoritative and they have a standard model of the universe and they have, you know, Einstein and, you know, like quantum and all this. But then also they say that, well, what we're talking about is only 3% of the universe, according to our theory. 97% is dark matter and dark energy. And dark means we didn't see it. And we can't therefore talk about it, really. It's invisible, because it's dark. And we're working on it, though. So what kind of secure knowledge is that? I'd like to ask you. You have some theories about 3% of things that you see, but they wouldn't work, any of those theories, if there was a 97% that you didn't see. And you don't know what that's doing because you don't see it. And you just are seeing what you think, its, it's impact is on the 3% that you do see. So you say it's there. But you're just groping, actually, in the dark, aren't you? So, therefore, you should really think about Karl Popper. All of your theories are simply hypotheses awaiting falsification by further measurement and data and evidence and experience. And then you should try to refine your methods of experience. And if you do, then Buddha has assured you that, and many other people after Buddha, millions of people actually, that you can experience what it is, but it will not fit under your mathematics, which is just a language. It will not fit under your English or German or Russian or Chinese or French or Spanish or Swahili or whatever language. It is un unsusceptible to being captured by by, by verification or falsification, ultimately. But relatively, on the other hand, you know, a theory like, well, if I get up and walk, if I don't eat some poison, I can get up and walk out the door, you know. That's a useful theory, and relatively speaking, normally we follow that what is most useful, and without getting super attached to it. And that way we, we are thriving, and we are capable of thriving. Okay, so... Yes, dear. Vimalakirti. Back yes, yes. So back to Vimalakirti. Well, I'm coming back to Vimalakirti, but just to finish, therefore, let me say that while viruses are said to be non-sentient by Western science, modern science, um, whatever they are, micro-beings, they seem to have a big impact. And they interact with sentient beings, for sure, and where a lot of us are sick, many have died, which doesn't mean they've stopped existing, they just have gone away from their particular body and they are looking for another body, probably most of them, and they will find them, for sure, and uh, depending on how they've be lived and behaved. So be loving and friendly. And um, so, uh, you know, we, it, it, the question is, is it more useful to think of them as sentient or insentient? And it might be more useful, I think, to think of them as sentient and to therefore pray for them and think, virus, you're killing people and uh, that's not nice. And uh, I know you're just, you don't really want to, you want to live in them, but then you, you become so uncontrollable in the way you live in them that it puts them to death because there are too many of you, I guess, and you put a block to their way of functioning, you know, you clog up their functioning. So, to think of them as sentient and make an appeal to them and don't give up on them, you never know, it might save someone's life. You know, others might just think, well, it's just not take it personally and not think of some evil being infecting them and just think that it's too bad and, and just want to go through it and they'll be better not thinking of it as a sentient being. So, in a way, it's good or it could be good or bad either way you know, that you think about it, you know. So, the best thing is to love viruses, even, even though you're trying to get them to go somewhere else or not to come dwell in you. But to love them is good. Love you should love everything. You should love trees and flowers. People should say, I love the lawn, I love grass, I love green grass, I love the forest, I love the trees. Our beloved Greta Thunberg says she loves the earth and she wants to save it for her own future life and other children's future life. She's annoyed with us, she, the earth is annoyed with us, that we're wrecking it the way we live. And she speaks to us, and it's so wonderful what she speaks and says. She's just absolutely wonderful, and we love her. So now I come to Vimalakirti. 
because it's fun, you know, it's fun for you to think about other cultures and other ways beings have seen the world. And particularly a being like a Buddha who is an enlightened being, Buddha means enlightened, it's Buddha was not his personal name, his personal name was Siddhartha originally, which means one who attains their goal. And then he, when he became a Buddha, he was called Shakyamuni, which means the sage of the Shakya nation. You know, the Shakyamuni was his name. And um, anyway, uh, so anyway, my sutra is a book you can buy from the Penn State University Press called The Holy Teaching of Vimalakirti. And then, but I'm not selling it. Um, uh, I'm not interested in selling it, but I'm, because I, I also own those rights. I, I let them do this, but I also own the rights, and I gave the rights freely to the 84,000.com, www.84,000.com, and they have it on their website, and then they said, well, they wanted to edit it according to their current lights of editing, and, uh, and I said, well, I want to change a few things since I did the book, but very little, I think, needs changing. And then they looked at it, and then also we found a Sanskrit copy, and we checked it against the Sanskrit. It's really very accurate and very reliable. But I did change one thing. I don't call it the holy teaching of Vimalakirti anymore. I call it the noble teaching of Vimalakirti. And maybe I'll explain that in the next eight sessions. I'm going to do eight, ten, or maybe twelve sessions on Vimalakirti, and each one will deal with a chapter. And so then later, they can, this can be collected as a commentary on the Vimalakirti Sutra, which I am fond of, and I'm still just beginning to study it, actually, Geshe Laha. You are 100% right, in case you're listening. Uh, I'm just beginning to study it, and because I enjoy it so much, and uh, I don't sit back thinking, I understand it completely, there's still things I don't understand about it, although it's a reliable, accurate translation, and I think I know more about it than I did then, but I still hope to still know more. Really, because things will be so different when you really know everything, which I hope to do, but maybe not this life, maybe another life. So the first chapter is called The Purification of the Buddha Field, although the word, you know, the, in, in Indian culture or Sanskrit, purification was a very big deal. Even before the modern Sanskrit culture, in the earlier culture of India called the Harappan, which was... Um, created by a people, sort of like the Egyptians, they were the Egyptians of India. I think they're the same people who live in South Indian nations nowadays, like Kerala, Tamil Nadu, um, Karnataka, uh, Andhra Pradesh, those people. They're darker skinned, and they're very brilliant, and actually they're more feminist than the northern people, the Indo-European sort of generated people. They're, they're, they respect their women more, which is a great fortune that they had. But then the unfortunate was that because of that, they were more gentle, by, because they respected their women, they were more gentle, and then they were pushed down by the so-called Aryans, the, the, the motorcycle gangs, but they, weren't, they had horse-drawn chariots rather than motorcycles of those days, about four or 5,000 years ago. And they were pushed down south in the southern part of India, and the great river valleys of the north were taken over by the Sanskrit, so-called Vedist culture, which is really kind of a European type of culture, actually. Although they don't, Sanskrit is connected to Greek and Latin and, and German and so on. And, um, and so that word Arya was originally a racial term for them. And then, then, and then it, it came to mean a holy person. But, but it's better to call it noble because then they made it into a class term when they were dominating those other people that they came in and, and sort of sat on top of, the more gentle people, uh, the meek, you know, who were more gentle. And uh, then they called it like noble, and that meant by class. And then Buddha used, uh, you know, spun off, uh, riffed off the class meaning of noble. And he said, uh, yeah, but noble doesn't mean in the upper class. The lower class people also are noble. No, what noble means is noblesse oblige. It means someone who cares for others equally as himself, who has that level of altruism and that level of compassion. That's a noble person. A noble person is not just someone who is born as the spoiled brat of an upper class person. No way. They are often really nasty, as we, we, we can notice that actually nowadays in the US, very much so. That's not a noble person. A noble person is one who cares for other beings. And actually, not just as our concept, but physically feels empathic toward them 
and therefore, in a way, they're forced to care for them because they have expanded their awareness where they really feel what they feel, the other beings. So therefore, they don't want them to feel bad. Or I meant just like you don't want your own hand to feel bad, you know, because you're connected to that feeling. So when, you're connect when you become altruistic, truly altruistic, you're not connected in the same way as to your hand. You don't have a cable going there. But you get the vibe in the air and you really feel it. And therefore, you really care about it. And that's noble. So I went back to how, and then later such a person, other people consider holy an altruistic person because it's so extraordinary and so marvelous and they, or everyone likes a noble person because the, people like someone who cares about them, of course, it's just normal, you know. Because that doesn't mean they don't have some level of self-concern, but it means that they expand that self-concern to embrace others as equal with themselves, that's what it means. Okay, so noble, that's all I changed. So if you want to look it up, if you, if you want to follow in the next 10 or 12 or 8 sessions, I don't know how many, uh, as long as we were at home, in our rooms, Mother Nature puts our rooms, then um, you can get it from 84,000 for free, and you can follow up with what I'm going to teach, and what I'm going to give comment on, okay? So now it begins, and uh, my translation begins, Anyway, I should have labeled it. It says reverence to all Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, Arya Shravakas, that means noble apostles, and Pratyeka Buddhas, and uh, hermit Buddhas, in the past, present, and future. And, but that is not actually part of the original sutra. That is the salutation by the translator into Tibetan that I'm translating, and um, into English here. And in a way, I, I, my, my salutation is, is in my dedication of the book, in my, um, in my preface and in my introduction, and you can say that's the English translator's dedication is there. Where's my, there's a preface. And uh, uh, I'd rather thank everybody. I guess I didn't make a special dedication page. I should have. Oh yeah, reverence to Manju Gosha, I say. The ever young crown prince. Well, if Manju Gosha is like the archangel of wisdom, of intelligence. And, um, so I'm paying homage to him because I'm needing my intelligence in the process of translating this book. I guess that's why I did it, rather than my gurus and my friends and my wife and my children and my teachers and so forth. Um, Justin, can you bring me some water? I'm going to need some water. Lots of water, if you would. So the real beginning of the sutra is, begins like this in English. Thus have I heard at one time. And evam maya shruttam ekasmin samaye, in Sanskrit that is. And uh, I have a whole long story about that, because it's at the beginning of any real sutra. And nowadays I don't like to say, have I heard, because it makes it sound more vague. So I say, thus did I hear at one time. That's what nowadays, if I would retranslate this, I would change it. But they didn't want me to do that, so I didn't do it for the 84,000 one. But another version that I will finally do, maybe before I croak, I will say, thus did I hear. And that's sort of more definite, you know. Have I heard is a little like, oh yeah, I heard around town, I've been hearing something, you know, like it was a rumor. And, um, but no, it, this, it's a specific sort of, this is certification of authenticity is what it is. It means just thus, what I'm about to repeat to you, uh, you know, what you're about to read, is what I did hear at a certain occasion, where I was with the Buddha, and uh, I, I read that, you know, that, that's what it means. So when they say, thus did I hear at one time, evam maya shruttam mikas min samaye, that means, and the samaye, as the word for time, is a very big word. It means at a meeting, at a meeting moment, at a moment of meeting, the ordinary and the extraordinary, because samaye means total coming together coming together, and what comes together is the hearer and the Buddha and the enlightened beings. So in this case, a lot of it is taught by Vimalakirti as another kind of enlightened being, also a Buddha eventually it seems to turn out, although he's a lay person, but he's not a monk like the Buddha is. But um, um, it's the meeting between the enlightened and the unenlightened, you could say, is the idea. You know? So the Lord Buddha, and the lucky Buddha, actually, you could, again, I would, might have retranslated, I might someday translate the lucky Buddha, because the word is Bhagavan. And Bhaga means good fortune. 
and Van means possessing good fortune. So lucky actually is Bhagavan, and because one who becomes enlightened is the lucky, lucky one, because everything is joyful to them, everything is beautiful to them. Even they live or die is beautiful. The process of death is beautiful. The process of being reborn is beautiful. The process of all the things of living, even painful things that seem painful once in a way has a value. And so even that is beautiful to such a being. And so they're really lucky, you know. So it really should be the lucky Buddha was in residence in the garden of Amrapali. Amrapali means one who possesses the mango fruits. And uh, Amrapali was a famous movie star, equivalent of a movie star in that era. A famous like a dancer, producer, um, you know, artist, uh, courtesan, you know, like a geisha, you know, this kind of thing, really high level uh, beauty, you know, who entertainer, let's say. So in the garden of Amrapali, and she was also extremely wealthy. And he was in her garden because she had a fabulous suburban estate. She also had a big mansion in the city, the great city of Vaishali, but uh, she had this country estate with a huge grove, a mango grove around the main houses. And when uh, Buddha would go to a place, a village or a city, he would accept the first invitation of anybody, whether rich or poor, male or female, you know, whatever, you know, political or not political. If they said, oh, bring your monks and come stay with me, because he used to have hundreds of people who travel with him, and he would uh, go and do that. And so he was staying in her grove, not in her house, but in her grove. She had a little hut there for the people to stay. In the city of Vaishali, attended by a great gathering. Of mendicants, there were 8,000, all saints. They were free, they were, every single one of them was a saint. That was why I was doing holy, you know. They were free from impurities and afflictions, and all had attained self-mastery. Their minds were entirely liberated by perfect knowledge. They were calm and dignified like royal elements. <laughs> royal elephants, sorry. <laughs> they were like great dignified royal elephants. They had accomplished their work, done what they had to do, cast off their burdens, attained their goals, and totally destroyed the bonds of unenlightened existence. They all had attained the utmost perfection of every form of mind control. So these mendicants, mendicant means, often this is translated by people as monks, but actually they're not like Christian monks who are withdrawn from the world because they don't like it and who are praying that God will save them in their life or after they die from the misery, the veil of tears, the valley of shadows of the world of life and death. And um, they don't necessarily think they can themselves free themselves. They think God has to do it, you know. And they are, so they tend to be a little mournful and they reject the world. Now the, the mendicant also rejects the ordinary way of being in the world. And they reject the family life and they reject paying taxes, earning a salary, raising a family, fighting in a war. They reject all of those things and they decide they're not going to do anything other than use their human life to attain enlightenment. And the mendicant means they wander so because they don't, they don't have a house. They leave the house and they wander and they seek food by gifts from people. And they're freeloaders in that sense, literally. And uh, it was all right to do that in India at this time because they have, was agriculturally extremely rich. It was the richest part of Eurasia. And they had a surplus and a lot of it just went to waste and rotted. So people did a mind giving. It was the one country in Eurasia where this mendicant sort of thing started up, you know, non-profit people it happened. And the kings also didn't need a lot of soldiers. It wasn't that violent. They occasionally had fights, but it wasn't that violent. And they didn't need, you know, every person to produce children and so forth because they, and produce food because they had more than enough. And they had more than enough people. So the Buddha, that's why he picked that place. Because it, it, they had a good enough economy that people could, people who decided there was a better thing to do with your human life than just eating, sleeping, and going to the bathroom, could really educate themselves in, in an inner way and come to really have a higher way of living and a higher type of understanding and so and being and and behaving and so he picked india because they could support that 
you know, and Confucius was living in the same time in China, and there was no choice, no chance to have such mendicants there. And Confucius often speaks about how awful it would be to have someone who wouldn't work for the nation. And he wouldn't allow a single person to do that type of thing. And he mentioned one or two ascetics that they had in China, and he was, they were the lowest form of scum. He refers to them like that. But that's the nature of the society. And in the West, they didn't have tolerated any such thing, whatever. In the deserts, in Persia, where they were conquering things, in Greece, where they had ate fish and drank retzina, and, and uh, they, they, didn't, they never would have done such a thing. So the mendicant thing is very important to translate as mendicant. And then there were female mendicants and male mendicants. And uh, the females were more numerous as the males because they had a much harder situation. Indian society at the time was still the, the Aryan society, the society of the Vedic type of people was very male chauvinist because they, you know, they were more militarist and they were less uh, kind to their women as the military people will be. You know. So these 8,000 were with him, that was a big group. Amapali must have been very wealthy. There were 8,000 mendicants, and they all were staying in this giant mango grove. And uh, then there were 32,000 bodhisattvas. Then he next he says, and then all the way he describes them. Basically, they're emphasizing that these were people who had come to develop a great understanding of themselves and a great control of their minds. And actually, most of them had already attained like a kind of nirvana. But on the other hand, they were not yet that capable of helping others. So they were still apostles or hermit Buddhas. They weren't like doing massive teachings and things. So some of them were, they, which is why maybe they should be really translated not as disciples, but maybe as apostles. Because they were, you know, it means that someone who does have a teacher and follows the teacher, but also teaches others. Whereas disciple, you don't get that. So I think apostle actually is the better word. I don't use that word myself here in this translation, but I think I will in the future. And um, totally destroyed the bonds of existence, I should explain. The Buddha did not, uh, in this, uh, you know, for them, he didn't fuss about what we call in Buddhism non-duality. Or he didn't make a big fuss about the fact that, you know, you can be enlightened and stay in the world. And he knew that people who had a certain, who were, who, did, who had a certain degree of hum, humility, actually, and a sense of, uh, were, were somewhat frightened by their culture, so as to have a low opinion of their own individual abilities, they didn't think they could become such a person who would be able to have such a, a strange understanding that you can be right here in the middle of everything and yet be simultaneously in bliss. And they couldn't, that would be too much for people, you know, for most people. So his initial wave of teaching in this time in the 6th century before the common era, 5th, 6th century before the common era, was to let them think that there was a place outside the world, beyond the world, like a transcendent place that they could get to that was nirvana. So he let them have a dualistic idea that nirvana was beyond life, you could say. So in a way, what they thought of as life, the unenlightened life, was the opposite of nirvana, which was beyond life. It isn't death either, but it, it let them think of it as a kind of death. And actually, to them, death didn't mean the nothingness that we imagine death to be, we modern materialist people in our materialist culture. Death meant for them uh, just another life, actually, because you'd be reborn, because they all had that common sense as we all should be getting nowadays. We're beginning to get it everywhere in the world now, actually. But, but we, we still, the theory, there's a rear guard action, powerful rear guard action of the theory of being nothing after death, which of course I will discuss during these teachings a lot. But uh, it, was not, uh, it was not a majority thing in the old days. And any common sense person doesn't, doesn't think that. It's a, it's a little bit crazy, the idea that something can become nothing. It's actually a kind of incoherent statement, but I won't labor, I won't labor it just now because I'm just setting up the beginning of the Vimalakirti. So then the next audience that he had were bodhisattvas. And bodhisattvas, some of them could be mendicants. Well, some of them, a lot of them, probably most of them also were mendicants. But uh, there are a lot of them who are also lay people. And then there are some deities and other kinds of strange creatures who also could be bodhisattvas. And what bodhisattva means is a being who 
realizes there is such a thing as enlightenment as a kind of the summit of evolutionary possibility for a sentient being. That someone can become this blissful being that is capable of being of total benefit to everyone else as well as themselves. And uh, therefore they all want to be that. That's what everybody would like to be. Everybody would like to be happy, right? And so that means the ultimately happy being, the lucky being, you know, lucky Buddha. You know, as it should really be translated, Bhagavan really means lucky. And um, so, 32, so then the, but these are bodhisattvas, and what makes them a bodhisattva is not that they already have much powers, although a lot of these who are present with Buddha are like that, because they're kind of like, um, they can do mind, magical mind travel, they can come from other planets, they're like, they're almost like, they're like Dr. Spock, they're like the, the Enterprise people. They can go here and there because they couldn't possibly have just lived in this, in this, uh, some of them might be lay people from Baisali, but they couldn't possibly all live in this grove because there were 32,000 of them, great spiritual heroes who were universally acclaimed. They're almost like angels or something you could say, most of these. But, but ordinary being, a regular human, regular person can be a bodhisattva, uh, you know, who like, uh, uh, you know, who, meaning that they live for others equally to themselves. Doesn't mean they also are martyrs and don't live for themselves. They do, but they live for others equally to themselves. So they're they're always all in it together. That's a bodhisattva statement, really at a deep visceral level. We're all in this together. That's a bodhisattva statement. We all need to be a little bit bodhisattvas now in our in our while we're in our rooms in our coronavirus rooms. So there were thirty two thousand great spiritual heroes who were universally acclaimed. The great spiritual hero is Mahasattva. Sattva is like a hero, a warrior, a being of light. And everyone liked them. They were universally acclaimed. They were dedicated to the penetrating activity of their great super knowledges. That means they were naturally clairvoyant. They could know the f they were telepathic. They could know the future. They could uh, move around magically. You know, just instantly vanish and be somewhere else. Those were all the super knowledges. Um, they could hear what people were saying in the next city. They could see things like on the next continent if they wanted to. They had all these special powers. You know, uh, they were sustained by the grace of the Buddha. Uh, what a Buddha is is even more amazing. You know, it's like never mind at the moment. He's not really it's just such a person. We'll see that by the end of the teaching. Guardians of the city of the Dharma, and Dharma means reality as an organized thing, and reality as the teaching of what that reality is, and so which is like an organized curriculum, you could say, to enable us to come to an understanding of what is reality, because only by understanding reality will we be free of suffering, will we be happy, will we be able also to make others happy, and we can't really be happy unless we, others are also happy. You know? We won't really be happy. They upheld the true teaching, and their great teachings resounded like the lion's roar throughout the ten directions. And this lion's roar thing means that when they say like the lion's roar, they don't mean they were shouting all the time. <laughs> but I, I a little bit shout because I'm a little bit deaf, so I can't hear myself. But uh, the lion's roar is just an, a simile. And it's like the lion's lion is, is sort of by, by symbolically the most powerful animal. And so when a lion roars, then all the other animals know that the boss is there, sort of the most powerful one. So that means that their teaching is like the lion's roar. It has the ring of authenticity. It has the power of truth. And that, which it doesn't mean it's a dogma. It means the power of truth in the sense that it reflects the nature of reality is what it means. It's open, it opens the door to people to understand reality. That's what makes it powerful. It isn't powerful just because it's loud or because it's some rigid, rigid doctrine or dogma. You know, that's no good, you know. So, and their great teachings resounded like the lion's roar throughout the ten directions. Ten directions are east, west, north, south, and then the, the cardinal, the, the quarter directions are northeast, northwest, etc., and then up and down. That's called the ten directions. Uh, they were free of all obscurations. No, no, uh, they were dedicated, uh, they were, without having to be asked, they were the natural spiritual benefactors of all living beings. They maintained unbroken the succession of the three jewels. The three jewels means the teacher, 
enlightened one. The reality that is taught is the most important one, the reality itself, and which means nirvana, means an uh, excellent world, actually, is what it means, that everything is really great. And, uh, and then Sangha are those who are trying to live by such teaching and in such reality and live realistically with such a teacher and teaching. And that's called the Three Jewels. Um, uh, conquering devils and foes and uh, overwhelming all critics. So the devils, they, they are, they, Buddhists, they are, they are gods, and they are angels in the Buddhist world, and they are also devils and demons. And then foes are just opponents, you know, and then critics are people who are just, um, you know, trying to pretend that they know better and that they overwhelm them. These bodhisattvas do. Their mindfulness, intelligence, realization, meditation, incantation, and eloquence all were perfected. They were free of all obscurations and emotional involvements. And living in liberation without impediment, meaning they were always in nirvana. They were totally dedicated through the transcendences of generosity, subdued, unwavering, and sincere morality, tolerance, effort, meditation, wisdom, skill in liberative art, commitment, power, and intuitive wisdom, or intuitive gnosis. I use that word, but I, nowadays I wouldn't use that. I would just say intuition. As a kind of very direct kind of knowledge. They had attained the intuitive tolerance of the ultimate incomprehensibility of all things. They turned, that that's very important. That doesn't mean you can't understand where you are or where you're going or your name or the driver's license or whatever it is or your bank account or your state, the state of health or, or learning or whatever it is. That doesn't mean that. It means incomprehensible, ultimate incomprehensibility and that means that you allow that things ultimately are more than what they seem. As Hamlet said, you know, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, that are dreamt of in your philosophy. So, you know, the, the, the philosophy that Hamlet is trying to tell us there, that ultimately things are incomprehensible, that so that your relative comprehensions are not rigid and sort of fixated. That's the reason to, to know that. And it's to be tolerated, and in a way you have to tolerate it because you're, you're uncomfortable that ultimately you're not sure what's going on. You're in an ultimate state of openness, that is to say. It's frightening when you're, when you're unenlightened. It's fearful because you know you worry about what it might, what might happen. You know? And so therefore people make all kinds of, wrap themselves in all kinds of myths and legends and things that things are just exactly such and such a way so they feel safe. But actually, if they get too rigid about it, they become unrealistic, and then that makes them unsafe, actually. They turn the irreversible wheel of dharma, and that means the wheel of the teaching about reality. And it's irreversible because it comes from reality, and actually reality wins, you know. When it's a fantasy versus reality, reality wins. They were stamped with the insignia, insignia of signlessness. That means openness. You know, that, that, that things ultimately, you know, do not contain intrinsic significance. They do have relational significance, but not, that it's not, not fixated in them, some particular significance. They were expert in knowing the spiritual faculties of all living beings. They were brave with the confidence that overawes all assemblies. They had gathered the great stores of merit and of wisdom, and their bodies, beautiful without ornaments, were adorned with all the auspicious signs and marks. They were exalted in fame and glory, like the lofty summit of Mount Sumeru. That's like the planetary axis, you could say, or you could call it Mount Everest, but it isn't. It's the, in a way, it's the whole, it's the axis of the whole planet. Be much bigger than Mount Everest in the old cosmology. Their high resolve, their Messiah spirit, you could call it, as hard as a diamond, unbreakable in their faith in Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. But Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha are the three jewels, you know, teacher, teaching, and community. They showered forth the rain of ambrosia that is released by the light rays of the jewel of the Dharma, which shines everywhere. That's so nice. Uh, you know, it's a jewel, like a wish-fulfilling jewel. When you meet the Dharma, which just means, you meet, in a way, it's you meet science. It's you meet, you meet anything that reveals reality. It also could be poetry. 
Science is not the only thing that seeks to reveal reality. It goes at things in a certain investigative way, or it should, which is experience, experiment. Science is not really the dogmas that, that, that hypotheses are made into by less than scientific people who are just trying to dominate or be, act like they're authorities. Science is the exploration of things, is the openness to things. And so the, 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 that's a jewel to be open in that way. Because then you find the jewel of life, which is the jewel of reality. And reality is a jewel where there is a, a plenitude for every being. It's what reality is, is what the, Buddha, what the Buddha discovered, why he had good news for people. And Jesus also had good news. And Muhammad and everyone, they thought it all came by a god. But of course, Buddha said it was everywhere. But and that, you know, Lao Tzu had the same good news. The good news is that reality, if you understand it, is great. You don't have to be ignorant of it. You want to really find out what it is. It'll surprise you it is so great. You know, it's much greater than you even would imagine you could expect, is what he's saying. That's why it's the jewel of the Dharma, you know, which shines everywhere. It, it's all shining in everything. It's already there. That's what he's saying. Their voices were perfect in diction and resonance and versatile in speaking all languages. They had penetrated the profound principle of relativity and had destroyed the persistence of the instinctual mental habits underlying all convictions concerning finitude and infinitude. So conviction here is represented as a more too rigid, too rigid an idea. It's like, oh, it's really this way, or it's really that way, or it's really not this way, or really not that way. It's like, it's, uh, it's like uh, uh, an ambrosia when, when, you know, it's like uh, 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 when you destroy the persistence of the instinctual mental habits underlying all convictions concerning the finitude and infinitude. So it's like, we have a deep insecurity and a habit we just got it's got to be the way i think you know it's got to be what i know it's got to be that because i feel insecure otherwise you see and that's a deep instinctual thing they spoke fearlessly like lions sounding the thunder of the magnificent teaching unequal they surpassed all measure they were the best captains for the voyage of discovery of the treasures of the dharma the stores of merit and wisdom these are the evolutionary stores that you gather through your behavior and your, your accomplishment and your understanding and what you do and say. You create the stores of, of both merit, evolutionary merit, which brings you into good forms of life and good experiences, and wisdom brings you into deeper, deeper knowledge. The ultimate knowledge being the experience of the perfect reality. And he goes on more because it's so important to say what is the Bodhisattva, because that's what we want to be when we realize how amazing it is to be truly loving and altruistic, which is how you become a bodhisattva. You cultivate that side of yourself. They were expert in the way of the Dharma, which is straight, peaceful, subtle, gentle, hard to see, and difficult to realize. They were endowed with the wisdom that is able to understand the thoughts of living beings, as well as their comings and goings. They had been consecrated with the anointment of the peerless intuition of the Buddha, with their high resolve, with their messiah attitude, they approached the ten powers, the four fearlessnesses, and the eighteen special qualities of the Buddha. Wonderful. With their, yeah, they had crossed the terrifying abyss of the bad migrations. Bad migrations are hell, animal, you know, non-human, non-language animal, life forms, and then something called pretas, which people call hungry ghosts, but they're not ghosts, they're hungry beings, they're hunger beings, really hunger beings. I mean, they have a, like weird bodies, they're worse, they're more worse off than insects, actually. Yeah, but they're kind of in the, in the direction that insects are from the regular, other kind of animals and mammals and reptiles and things, you know where they, you know, they have a little soft, tiny thing that lives for a really short time and is terrified all the time, and uh, has a skeletal, like weird skeleton outside of the soft part, etc., rather than inside. It's really weird. Anyway, never mind. 
and yet they assumed reincarnation voluntarily in all migrations for the sake of disciplining living beings. So in, in order to help teach living beings, they would still go and be an animal. They would go and be in hell. They would go and be in a hungry, a hunger land. They wouldn't mind. Because even when they were there, because of their vast lovingness and their expandedness and the fact that they were, li they lived, they were in their body lightly. And why? Because they were also everything around themselves. So they could bear all kinds of things that would be unbearable to someone who was only like rigidly locked inside a particular skin. Is the idea. You know? And great kings of medicine, understanding all the sicknesses of passions, they could apply the medicine of the Dharma appropriately to every living being. So we're, this is nice, that's a nice one. The kings of medicine is this. Um, this spa is dedicated to the medicine Buddha who is like the, considered the king of medicine, the blue medicine Buddha. There's like a picture of him here. They were inexhaustible minds of limitless virtues, and they glorified innumerable Buddha fields, or Buddha verses, I call it nowadays, with the splendor of these vir virus, uh, virtues. <laughs> Viruses, virtues. They conferred great benefit when seen, heard, or even approached. Were one to extol them for innumerable hundreds of thousands of myriads of aeons, one still could not exhaust their mighty flood of virtues. So there's 32,000 of these angelic, amazing souls. Just imagine like the place is filled with angels. Because these beings are like angels, really powerful beings. And not just like one of them, like Keanu Reeves or somebody, like wandering around being an angel. But infinite numbers, but they don't have to be visible even. They could be invisible. But they're everywhere around. Actually, America and the world are a little bit coming back to that ancient view that there were many, many positive spirits in the world, you know. And so this, therefore, we can kind of way understand this culture where they had that sense they're there. And in Buddha's time, then people could see them very much. But they, they didn't need food, so, she, so Amrapali didn't have to provide rice for them, whatever. They were, because they are these kind of like beaming in and beaming out beings, like they had transporter, they were their own transporter beings, type of persons, right? These bodhisattvas were named Samadarshana, Asamadarshana, and it goes on with lots of names, which are in Sanskrit, which I know no need to repeat, and so forth with the remainder of the 32,000. Now this is even more amazing. They were also gathered, that's totally amazing, of course. This is like sci-fi. This is going to be a lesson in sci-fi. So if you don't like the Mahayana, the universal vehicle, the glory of the universal vehicle, of Buddhism, then you don't need to listen. But it's very positive and very deep also, and very rational and very critical and very loving. So hopefully most of you will, will like it. There are also gathered there 10,000 Brahmas. Now that is so weird, like, and believe me, when I first translated this, I couldn't figure out what was going on. 10,000 Brahma. Now Brahma, in Buddha's time, Brahma, was considered the creator. So, for ordinary people, the idea that at the, the, the time when this first existed, this text, that means 10,000 creator gods, not just one creator god, 10,000 of them. So what that means is that the creator gods from other universes had came over from 9,999 other universes, came over to listen to this sutra, to come and be a witness to this sutra, because they're going to be so far out. And they were like parked in the sky or something. I don't know where they were all staying or what, or maybe they miniaturized themselves or whatever they were. Because of course, a creator, from a Buddhist point of view, a creator is not the exclusive creator, but is the most powerful deity in a, in a universe, in a particular universe, in our universe. So there are 10,000 of them. And that, with their head, Brahma Shikin, and Shikin means the crested one, the one who lives on the crest, the crown, the crowned one. And, um, and he's the creator of this world. In the people who think there is a creator, Buddha knows there's a real most powerful being, but not a creator. Not in the sense, the Western sense of creating everything, just, you know, and controls it all. It's all just that person. Not, not, not the Buddha doesn't think that's correct. Who had come from the Ashoka universe with its four sectors, to hear, see, venerate, and serve the Buddha, and to hear the Dharma from his own mouth. There were 12,000 chakras, chakras like uh, Zeus, 
and because they simultaneously had a kind of Greek pantheon of deities in addition to kind of a monotheistic creator in the culture, I'm saying, Buddha rejected that, as I said, the monotheistic creator, but they didn't reject that there was such a being, just rejected that he'd done that, put it that way. And, uh, and the chakras are like the Zeus's and the Olympus, you know, live on the top of the Axel Mountain. So that they, that they kept that alive within the Indian culture from various four sector universes. And there are other powerful gods, Brahmas, Chakras, Lokapalas, world protectors, that means uh, Devas, Nagas, Yakshas, Gandharvas, Asura, Gadara, Tikinara, and Mahodaga. So all kinds of, uh, of uh, strange uh, creatures, uh, dragons, and, and uh, birdmen, and fairies, and you know, the real panoply of strange creatures. But they all like to listen to Buddha anyway, though, because they're intelligent. Finally, there was, and they know language. Finally, there was the fourfold community, consisting of male mendicants, female mendicants, ordained lay men, and ordained lay women. The lucky Buddha, thus surrounded and venerated by these multitudes of many hundreds of thousands of living beings, sat upon a majestic lion throne and began to teach the Dharma. Dominating all the multitudes, just as Mount Sumeru, the king of mountains, looms high over the oceans, the lucky Buddha shone, radiated, and glittered as he sat upon his magnificent lion throne. Lion thrones as lions, as the you know, as the carved lions with the side, you know, armrests of the throne, you know, like a big marble throne. And uh, somehow he produced one, or Amrapali made him one, or uh, what magic is the gods brought one, however, you know. It's very sci fi. Thereupon the Lichavi Bodhisattva Radnakara, now here's a humanoid uh, Bodhisattva who comes from Vaishali, a citizen, and he's actually kind of yuppie. And he's there with 500 other young yuppies out of the very, very wealthy city of Vaishali, with 500 Lichavi youths each holding a precious parasol made of seven different kinds of jewels, marvelous pearl-encrusted emeralds and rubies and diamonds and things, uh, carrying as an umbrella, but an umbrella against the sun, you know, silk and beautiful silk and silk cloth and things, came forth from the city of Vaishali and presented himself at the grove of Amrapali. Each approached the Buddha, bowed at his feet, circumambulated him clockwise seven times, laid down his precious parasol in offering, and withdrew to one side. That's just a formality of how you greet such a high teacher in the Indian culture at the, in that day, apparently. As soon as all these precious parasols had been laid down, suddenly, by the miraculous power of the lucky one, they were transformed into a single precious canopy so great that it formed a covering for this entire billion world galaxy. Now, now when I ran into that, when I was first translated, I thought, what is he talking about? And a billion worlds, so it's not the planet. And, and yet it has one giant axial mountain. So it, maybe it's not just one galaxy. But then I decided one galaxy has like billions of worlds. So. Maybe we'll think of it as a galaxy. Maybe that corresponds to our Western idea of a galaxy. And there, we don't know. So we don't see a mountain in the middle of the of the of the Milky Way galaxy. But you know, maybe there's a dark mountain there. <laughs> anyway, they had an old-fashioned thing. They didn't think the Earth was flat. They thought it was a giant clump with a of a giant mountain. And then they thought that where they lived in India was a flat thing that stuck out from the mountain. And there were other things sticking out where other people live. But the overall thing was actually a big lump, like a kind of big egg or something. They had different, they had different ideas about it. But they didn't, they didn't have the solar system, you know, third planet out and all that. They didn't have that idea. But, uh, and Buddha didn't try to change that for the people because that wasn't his focus. It wasn't considered the important thing. And, uh, so, but anyway, and so, so I couldn't, what is this? And I couldn't figure out what it was. And then finally I figured out it was like a planetarium. So he had a pile of 500 jeweled parasols. Must have been a big messy pile in front of him, sitting there on his life throne. And so he just did a piece of performance art with his sort of like, a, you know, what is it called? The hologram, 
the hollow deck and the, in Star Trek. That's what I. He around the Buddha is like a hollow deck. So he made like a suddenly different thing, and he he made a situation where beings were in a giant planetarium. In a way, he had a second universe reflecting the actual universe to the beings who were in this thousand, multi-thousand assembly that were in there, something like that, right? And why did he show that? Then it says, the surface of the entire billion world galaxy was reflected in the interior of the great precious canopy, where the total content of this galaxy could be seen. Limitless mansions of suns, moons, and stellar bodies. The realms of the devas, nagas, yakshas, gandharvas, asuras, garudas, kiranas, mahogas, all those kind of supernormal beings as well as the realms of the four Maharajas. These are like Santa Claus and they're like the guardians of the North Pole and the South Pole, this kind of deity, you know. The king of mountains and then all kinds of mount mountain ranges. All the great oceans, rivers, bays, torrents, streams, brooks and springs. Finally, all the villages, suburbs, cities, capitals, provinces and wildernesses. All this could be clearly seen by everyone. And the voices of all the Buddhas, of the ten directions, that means in all the different planets in the giant billion world galaxy. Because there are many such humanoid planets already in this, in this sci-fi world of the, of the Mahayana Buddhas. Could be heard proclaiming their teachings of the Dharma in all the worlds. The sounds reverberating in the space beneath the great precious canopy. So, in a way, what is this? This is showing the being. There are the interconnectedness of all of nature, you know, the vision of the relative, magical relative reality of the universe, seeing everything and all the planets and all the life forms and all the cities and all the mountains and forests and rivers and plains, like super, you know, BBC nature show, you know, <laughs> he's showing them all this, you know, and uh, because he's preparing them to shift their perception of this world from into showing its magical and extraordinary quality, rather than thinking of it as a frightening place, which is what they did think, what people, what human beings are raised to be afraid of things and be scared about what's going to happen to me, you know, everybody thinks. You know. So he just showed this amazing vision of the universe, like a, totally like when Al Gore tries to teach the Climate Reality Project leadership training, which I went to last year and which everyone should go to. Uh, he tries to show us the interconnectedness of everything. And the real lesson of it is this climate change thing that we're learning now. Because it's invisible, we don't see the carbon and the, and the methane and the nitrous oxide that's up there that is changing the temperature of the planet and is threatening the, and make, creating the imbalance that threatens the lives of the great extinction beings that are being killed off all the network of all the different life forms on the planet, bless us humans, finally and all the trees and all the plants and the crops and our food just totally destroys and threatens. We can't see that. And yet it's, we're totally interconnected to it and it's totally affecting our, our thing. And, and, and luckily our scientists tell us how we can uh, stop creating this disastrous, like a monstrous cloud. That's the true stranger thing, you know. Like my granddaughters show their stranger thing. This is the real stranger thing, is an invisible cloud surrounding the planet that is choking the life out of us all, choking the life out of many other creatures already, and many also less fortunate, the more poor, more underdeveloped people lost in the tropics in Africa and Asia, in our own Latin countries, and even in our own America, the people downwind from different horrible, you know, refineries and polluting factories in Galma Squatch. So it's invisible what we've done, but we can but we can change our visible behavior to affect it, and that way we can save our lives and save the lives of future generations and ourselves and our future lives. But he showed them a vision like that, by the way. So then, at this vision of the magnificent miracle, affected by the supernatural power of the lucky Buddha. The entire host was ecstatic, enraptured, astonished, delighted, satisfied, and filled with awe and pleasure. They bowed down to the Tathagata. Tathagata means the realized transcendent one. Withdrew to one side, with palms pressed together, 
and gazed upon him with fixed attention. The young Lichavi Ratnakara, which means jewel mine, actually is his name, Ratnakara, I mean, knelt with his right knee on the ground, raised his hands, palms pressed together, and saluted the Buddha, and praised him with the following hymn. So I won't go on with the following, I don't have my watch, I won't go on with the following hymn, because it's long, although it's beautiful. Because I want to, at least since I said I would do eight or twelve, I want to cover the whole chapter. And there's a lot of other amazing th scenes and things in the chapter. And maybe I don't have to do that. How long has it been, actually, now? One hour, ten minutes. Okay, well, I don't, I'm, I'm going on another ten minutes or so, so it'll be, it'll be an eighty minutes, like an eighty minute class. And then I might come back to some of the great things in the, the chapter. But, because um, the introductory one maybe takes a little more time. So, so, and I might read his first verse, you know. Pure are your eyes, broad and beautiful like the petals of a blue lotus. Pure is your thought, having discovered the supreme transcendence of all trances. Immeasurable is the ocean of your virtues, the accumulation of your good deeds. You affirm the path of peace. O oh, great wanderer, obeisance to you. So he goes on like that. Leader, bull of men, we behold the revelation of your miracle. The superb and radiant fields of the bliss lords appear before us, and your extensive spiritual teachings that lead to immortality make themselves heard throughout the whole reach of space. And he goes on like that. And finally he says, You associate with living beings by frequenting their migrations, yet your mind is liberated from all migrations. Now, migration means a life form, because we're all migrants. So we migrate through death into another life form, all of us. Whether, and we don't have a passport at birth. <laughs> we don't get one until later. Just as the lotus born of mud is not tainted thereby, so the lotus of the Buddha preserves the realization of freedom. You nullify all signs in all things everywhere. You are not subject to any wish for anything at all. The miraculous power of the Buddhas is inconceivable. I bow to you who stand nowhere like infinite space. So then, uh, he, um, Radhakara, he finished, you know, there are a lot of other great verses, but I skipped them. He then asked the Buddha the big question that the 500 young Bodhisattvas, they're all Bodhisattvas, by the way, and they all came to ask the Buddha the, the big question. And it's actually almost, it's also a political question. It's an engineering question, it's a political question. A lot of, some people occasionally get annoyed with me from my podcasts and things, because I get involved in current politics sometimes in the middle of Dharma song, as if that's not Dharma. But this is wrong, it's all Dharma. Dharma is uh, fitted with life, it's the reality of life. And the Dharma of Bodhisattvas is things should go well in life. And if current societies are being mismanaged and it's terrible and people are being harmed and being killed and they're being deprived of their human opportunity to become loving and kind and happy and enlightened, then that's, a, that's an issue of Dharma. There's no such thing as some pure place outside of the world as Dharma. And then Dharma is then the world we're just going to ignore and it's annoying to have to think about. That's not correct, actually. That's unfortunate rigid conviction is involved there, and that a person is imprisoning themselves in that way. So therefore, I kind of purposely do that, to keep this immediate and relevant to all. Otherwise, why are we doing some reading some ancient book, even in translation? So anyway, so they, but they ask their question, and they say, uh, Oh, lucky one, lucky Buddha, these 500 young Lichavis, are truly on their way to unexcelled perfect enlightenment. You know, he's the spokesperson, but he's speaking for all of them, all 500 of them. And they have asked, what is the Bodhisattva's perfection of the Buddhaverse? Please, Lord, explain to them the Bodhisattva's perfection of the Buddhaverse. So in other words, how, in other words, they say, we're already on our way to enlightenment. We want to be Bodhisattvas. We love all beings. We want to be, help them all, etc. But to do that, you have to change the whole world that they're in. And how do you, and that, that world we call the Buddhaverse. How do you do that? How do you make it perfect? How do you make it pure? How do you make it beautiful? 
Why, how can you do that? That seems overwhelming. In other words, it doesn't seem overwhelming that we can develop our own minds and do something. But how do we change the world? Really, is what, they, is what the question. You know? So then, Shakyamuni is very likes that. He says, "Good, excellent, excellent, young man. Your kusadu sadu, kulaputra." He says, "Kumara, your question to the Tathagata about." The perfection and purification of the Buddha field is indeed good. Therefore, young man, listen well and remember. I will explain to you the perfection and purification and beautification of the Buddha field, the Buddha verse of the Bodhisattvas. Very good Lord replied, uh, lucky Lord replied Lord Naka and the 500 young Machavis, and they set themselves to listen. And then the Buddha said, noble sons, a Buddha verse of Bodhisattvas is a field of living beings. Why so? A Bodhisattva embraces a Buddha verse to the same extent that he or she causes the development of living beings. She embraces a Buddha field to the same extent that living beings become educated. He embraces a Buddha field to the same extent that to entrance into a Buddha verse, living beings are introduced to the Buddha intuition. She embraces a Buddha field, Buddha verse, to the same extent that to entrance into that Buddha field, living beings increase their holy spiritual faculties. Why so, noble son? A Buddha field of bodhisattvas springs from the aims of living beings. So this is a really interesting idea. The world is not just a bunch of rocks and stones and some inanimate things here or there. The world is the intersubjective, interconnected mind field of living beings. But of course, remember, it doesn't just include you or one or two people or even just humans. All the animals, all the humans, all the strange creatures, all the gods, all the demons, all the devils, they're sort of where their minds meet, is shaped, the matter is shaped, the bodies and matter is shaped into an interactive field. It's like a virtual reality, it's like a holodeck. The whole world actually is like a holodeck. But it, and it's what shapes a holodeck is not a computer, it is the interwoven computers of the minds and brains of infinite numbers of beings, and that includes divine beings, demonic beings, all kinds of really powerful ones. And it, but everyone is a creator in that sense. Not just one is the creator, everyone is a creator. Maybe. The Buddhas and Bodhisattvas being more powerful than even the highest gods are shaping it more effectively and dominantly, fortunately, but everyone is intercreating is the thing. This is a really important definition of the world, which shows you why everything matters. There's no thing that doesn't matter that's like outside. And Dharma deals with the reality of everything. That's what it that's that's why they say, you know. Some Zen people say, and some wonderful East Asian poetic types say, that they, you know that they heard the Dharma being taught them by the grass. They heard the Dharma taught by the trees, by the leaves, by the flowers, by the bees, by the stream, gurgling of the stream, by the crashing of the waves, the ocean, by the thunder and the lightning, everything is teaching the Dharma. The politicians <laughs> are teaching it, too. So then, he gives a long talk, and I'll come back to it, I think, in the second talk, some of the details of the talk, because this is the thing. Because we're online and we're stuck at home, we're stuck in our rooms by Mother Earth. Mom the Earth has put us to our room. Go to your room. Think about what it all means, what is life about. She has sent us here. We didn't run to our rooms when Greta scolded us, speaking as the oracle of Mother Earth. We listened and we were moved, we wanted to do something, but then we went on about business as usual, didn't we? But now we're in our room thinking about no business as usual. So and then I want to get to details, because you learn so much from details. But I want to just also give you the overview. And that is that he gives this long spiel, and then Saint Shariputra, the noble Saint Shariputra, who is his foremost apostle, you know, like, uh, but still a little bit dualistic. 
and uh, he's not a yet. He's not a yet. He's, he's not. Yeah, he is a kind of bodhisattva, really, but he's not manifesting as a bodhisattva. He's manifesting as a dualist to help others who are dualistic to join. You know, to find their opportunity. So he cleverly thinks sort of way. He doesn't really think it, but Buddha plants the thought in his mind, even. So it's awful. But he says, Shariputra thinks, wait a minute. The Buddha verse is so amazing. And its amazingness is reflecting the amazingness of the evolutionary deeds and heroic deeds of the Bodhisattva over billions of lifetimes. Then what's wrong with this Buddha? And then once they become Buddha, they make, that makes their Buddha verse, which is the world around them, within which they help others. And if that's the case, why does this world suck so bad, full of crap, he literally says. He thinks that. And of course, many, many things that Buddha reads his mind, actually Buddha put the thought in his mind, because it's telepathy, you know. So Buddha says, Shariputra, is it the fault of the sun and the moon that people blind from birth cannot see them? And Shariputra says, oh, oh, no, it's not the fault of the sun and the moon, when they're shining away there. It's the blind person just doesn't have sight, so they can't see them. Even so, Shariputra, he says, you don't see the virtues and the glory of my Buddhaverse because you are blind up to its virtues and glories because of your dualism. So it's not that my Buddhaverse lacks these glories, etc. He says, it's really awesome. And then Brahma, who's the local creator with his 10,000 other fellow Brahmas who are all there, he chimes in from the sky. It doesn't say where he is, but he must be sitting in the sky. And he speaks to Shariputra. He says, oh, Shariputra, you're so short-minded. Your mind is full of difficulties and dualisms. And that's why you don't see the perfection and the beauty of this world. You know, I see it as fabulous, you know. I'm, although I'm not Buddha, but I'm just a god, but I can see how great it is. And different beings see it in different ways. So he goes, I put you, okay, okay, okay. So I put you sort of accepts it, but he doesn't really accept it because he still doesn't see that. So then what Buddha does is he puts a foot down on the ground, his big toe, they say, he puts his toe down. And he's barefoot, I guess, he's on the throne there, has a sandal sitting below him, puts his toe on the ground, and the minute he touches the ground with his toe, Shariputra and all the thousands of beings in this assembly suddenly see the world as if it's all made of jewel plasma. It's all like the most exquisite, beautiful, amazing thing. The, no, our notion of a little diamond or ruby or some kind of little hard stone with facets, it's just that it gives you like a tiniest hint of the whole world looks like jewelry. Fantastically beautiful. And, but more, most important among that jewelry it looks, then they suddenly realize that there's no fault in the world. And therefore, they're in a perfect place for within which to develop themselves and evolve to their own poss best possible, highest form of being. So for them in specific, each one sees, they are in the best of all possible situations for themselves. So they see that it's, it's like a massive silver lining vision, you could call it. It's a universe of silver linings that they see. And, and, and then, they, then Buddha rubs it in, of course, to Shariputra, and he says, Shariputra, hey, do you think it's a pretty cool Buddha verse that I made here? What do you think? And he says, oh, it's amazing. I never imagined, unbelievable, etc., blah, blah. He flips out, and he's really amazed that the, that the world really is some completely different way than the way he always thought it was. And of course, he doesn't get into the idea of maybe it's, it, maybe this is also kind of a little bit illusory, but never we won't get into that. But it, basically, it's perfect for him to do his evolutionary best and reach Buddhahood himself, not just sainthood, but Buddhahood. And then, uh, and then everybody has a wow kind of thing, completely flips out. And then Buddha picks up his toe. And the minute he does, it looks like it did ordi like the ordinary world that they're ordinarily used to. And which is kind of a lesson in impermanence, in transformability, in change. And then around then, then they say you know, that uh, 
He said, while, he says, when that happened, then the Lord withdrew his miraculous power, and at once the Buddhaverse, Buddha field, was restored to its usual appearance. Then both humans and gods who subscribed to the disciple vehicle thought, alas, all constructed things are impermanent. Thereby 32,000 living beings purified their immaculate, undistorted Dharma eye, and that means a realistic eye, in regard to all things. And why do they call that a Dharma eye? Well, they just saw the world as completely different in two different ways. So what that meant, although maybe subliminally to many of them, was that they just related to the world forever differently. It's like someone who becomes really stoned, or has a super, or has a really powerful vivid dream, or has an amazing aesthetic experience in Close Encounters of the Third Kind, or The Matrix, or, or um, uh, you know, some, some uh, uh, amazing vision. And when they have that, and then they see the ordinary thing, subliminally, well, the ordinary thing may not be so ordinary. They cling to it a little bit less rigidly. They're open to the fact that it could be different. This makes them more open-minded and releases them from being rigidly stuck and just seeing things their way, so to speak, if you follow me. So that's the Dharma eye they're beginning to develop. An open-minded eye, a free eye, rather than it's a rigidly eye that always, always has to see it exactly the same way. The 8,000 mendicants were liberated from their mental defilements, attaining the state of non-grasping. They no longer grasp in, the, in their dualistic world of here's the world of suffering and death. And when I'm in a meditation, I'm in nirvana. They got rid of that dualism a little bit. They were freed from that, the state of non-grasping. And the 84,000 living beings who were devoted to the grandeur of the Buddhaverse, having understood that all things are by nature but magical creations, all conceived in their own minds, the spirit of unexcelled, totally perfect enlightenment. And what that spirit is, it's not like you become just enlightened when you open your mind like that. It means you develop a wish to become like that. And you develop an ambition to see the world in its truly magical, beautiful way. And that's the spirit, and then, you, then everything that you do contributes to that. And you have that spirit, and that's a spirit of, and because you know that you only get that way by loving other beings, by being happy yourself, by being compassionate and connected and realizing your connectedness to everything, realizing relativity and getting out of all your little hiding places and so forth. And uh, that's the spirit of unexcelled perfect enlightenment. And, and then even if you can, in conceiving that spirit, you, when you really make it strong is when you then make a vow. You sort of ceremonially and you ritually and you, you forcefully make a deep determination in the depth of your soul that I'm going to be a being who can shape the world like that, who can see the world like that, who can make it like that for others, a perfect place. You know, then that's the Bodhisattva spirit. Then they, if you really make that vow, you become a Bodhisattva. Even though you're still, all, you're still really stuck in the usual in most of the time, but you, you begin to change you're open to changing that usual because you're not insisting that that usual is just the way it is, in the usual rigid way. You're not insisting about that. You're ready to see it. You're open-minded. You're free, actually. Freedom is ultimate reality. That's what it is. Freedom is it. And freedom is not a fixed dogma because freedom is a negation. A negation just means it's free. It doesn't mean what it's free as just means it's free. So it can become all different kinds of things. That's like magical creation. Okay? So all the best. So thank you very much for attending. We will go on with that more in the future. That's only the first chapter. In the second chapter, Vimalakirti himself, the one means stainless fame, is introduced. And um, we will, when he's introduced in the thick of politics, he's in the thick of the world, and yet he's at the same Eventually, as it's revealed, he's the same as Buddha, although he doesn't claim to be the same as Buddha. He's extremely humble in honoring the Buddha, but his wisdom and compassion and miraculous ability actually is the same as Buddha. 
And that's a very big message, that the sort of holy monk, the pope, you could say, the great holy one, and the best layperson can be at the same, in the same world, and can be capable of the same thing, and can work for beings in their different respective ways. And so that sort of gives an idea of what's called the emanation body, the multiple bodies of enlightenment, embodiments of enlightenment that are working for us all the time, all around us that we should try to appreciate, okay? All the best, lots of love.